Great significance has always been given to a person's last words. Yet with the rise of modern technology, meaning more and more images are being captured, a person's last photo can often be far more touching and haunting. Here are my choices for five especially haunting last photos, with touching and often tragic stories behind them, proving that a picture really can be worth a thousand words. Number 5. The Last Jew in Venitsa Taken in 1942, this haunting picture was found in the personal album of an SS Death Squad soldier and is labelled on the back as The Last Jew in Venitsa. The image shows a soldier from Einsatz Group D, poised to murder a Jewish man kneeling in front of him. The victim can be seen staring intently at something or someone in the distance, and he seems to be the last person to be executed, as no other civilians can be seen in the picture. In front of him is a hastily dug mass grave, containing the bodies of several people, no doubt many of whom were friends, family and acquaintances of the unfortunate man about to be murdered, and his weary look hints at the horrors he must have witnessed during his final hours of life. The soldiers observing the horrific scene seem almost bored, as if they were watching an everyday event unfold, perhaps indicating that for these men, this really was just another day at the office. During the German invasion of the Soviet Union, SS death squads were sent alongside regular army units and given the task of killing all Jews, homosexuals, communists, partisans and anyone else considered to be undesirable or a threat to security. As such, it's likely that the uniformed men in this picture had been part of similar mass murders since their arrival at the front. The Ukrainian town of Vinitsa was the site of three massacres, with the third taking place in January of 1942, which was when this photo was taken. Prior to the three massacres, it was estimated that as many as 28,000 Jews lived in the town of Vinitsa. However, once the killing had ended, virtually all had been murdered, bar the tiny handful who managed to escape into hiding. The German officer Lieutenant Erwin Bingel had witnessed the second and possibly largest massacre which took place on September the 22nd, 1941, and later described the horrific scene. He recalled how several ditches were dug prior to specialist SS men arriving by plane. All Jews from the town had been summoned to the site to supposedly take part in an official census. However, unbeknown to them, they would not be leaving alive. Once they arrived, they were ordered to undress, handing over everything they had worn and carried on their person, before being made to stand in line in front of the pre-prepared ditches. The SS commandos then shot everyone in the line, before ordering those in the second row to step forward to the edge of the ditch. The men in this row were given shovels and ordered to heap lime upon the dead bodies in the ditch below them, before themselves being stripped of everything they owned and suffering the same fate. Number 4. Carl Williams Widely known as the baby-faced killer, Carl Williams might not look like the stereotypical gangland crime boss. However, he had a long history of crime that saw him rise from a petty thief and drug trafficker to become one of Australia's most powerful and well-known criminals. At the pinnacle of his career of crime, he reveled in media attention and was even portrayed in an Australian television series. However, fear of assassination was ever present on his mind, and he was rumoured to never eat in the same restaurant twice. In 1999, Williams was shot by rival Jason Moran, whom he owed thousands of dollars. Williams survived the attack, however the series of revenge killings that would follow would become known as the Melbourne Gangland Killings, and would eventually lead to Williams' downfall. At least 35 people were killed in the brutal gangland war, before Williams was finally arrested and confessed of three murders, as well as a conspiracy to murder a man whose remains had been found burning inside a wheelie bin, admitting to hiring contract killers to dispose of his enemies. He was sentenced to life in a maximum security prison with a non-parole period of 35 years, meaning that he would have been 71 before becoming eligible for parole. It was while in prison that the seeds of his destruction would be sown, the self-confessed gambler is believed to have done a deal with police, who offered to assist his family financially in exchange for information on a series of unsolved murder cases. This risky gamble proved his undoing, as the men his information might implicate were highly dangerous individuals who were prepared to kill to stay out of prison. On the 19th of April 2010, Australian newspapers broke the story that Victoria Police were paying $8,000 in school fees for William's daughter, a revelation which publicly linked Williams as a possible police informer. Just hours later, Williams would be dead. 
Matthew Johnson, a notoriously violent inmate, with a history of convictions and one of just two other men who shared the same area of the prison as Williams, was the man selected for the job. In this chilling CCTV still image, Johnson can be seen approaching Williams from behind, armed with a metre-long stem of metal removed from an exercise bike. With full knowledge that he was being recorded on camera, he viciously struck Williams on the right side of his head with the metal bar, before delivering seven more blows as Williams lay defenceless on the floor. Johnson then dragged the body into Williams' empty cell and headed to the exercise yard, where he calmly did a few laps as though nothing had happened. It took prison guards more than 30 minutes to discover the body, despite the whole incident taking place in full view of the CCTV cameras. Yet the brutality of the injuries William suffered meant that he had likely died during or not long after the attack. In a strange twist, Williams was reported to have been reading the very newspaper which reported his ties to Victoria Police as an informant at the moment he died. Matthew Johnson claimed to be acting alone in carrying out the attack, even going as far as to say the murder was committed in self-defence, as he feared Williams was planning to have him killed first. He pleaded not guilty to murder, yet the CCTV footage was enough to convict him, and he was given 23 years for the murder of Carl Williams. Despite this conviction, there are still unanswered questions regarding the circumstances of the killing. It's widely believed that information Williams was providing to the police may have linked the powerful crime boss Rocco Arico with an unsolved murder. The man who killed Williams was a known associate of Rocco Arico, so why had he been placed in the same prison unit as Williams? Was there simply incompetence on the part of police and prison officials, or could corruption be involved? The story is further complicated by the revelation that Williams was actively assisting detectives with the 2004 murder of Terry Hodson, who was a key witness in a police corruption scandal and was alleged to have been killed by a police officer who hired Williams to arrange the murder. The convenient death of Carl Williams meant that the murder charge against the policeman accused was dropped, leading some to hint at the possibility of a police conspiracy. Was this murder the result of corruption, a conspiracy, or simply a case of a man living by the sword and dying by the sword? Number 3. David Johnston In this photo, volcanologist David Johnston can be seen sitting next to the observation post where he was stationed with a notebook in hand. His smile is one of a man engrossed in scientific work which he so loved, however just hours later he would be dead. On May the 18th, 1980, a 5.1 magnitude earthquake below Mount St. Helens in Washington State loosened 2.7 cubic kilometers of rock from the mountain's north face, leading to an eruption of hot steam, volcanic gases, and pyroclastic flows that reached near supersonic speeds. The subsequent blast practically sheared off the top of the volcano, removing 1,300 feet from its height and destroying the surrounding landscape as the lava flows and landslides ruined everything in their path. Forests were flattened and the column of ash and gas released by the eruption rose as high as 15 miles into the atmosphere, scattering ash across 11 states. Enough timber to build 150,000 homes was estimated to have been destroyed and hundreds of square miles were reduced to something resembling a post-apocalyptic wasteland, with over $1 billion in damage caused. 57 people were killed in the devastation, including David Johnston. Alone at his observation post, David Johnston would have seen and understood what was rapidly coming his way. He had just enough time to contact his colleagues via radio, with his last words an intense shout of, Vancouver, Vancouver, this is it. Just moments later his position was engulfed by a dense mass of hot ash, lava and gas which would have likely taken less than a minute to reach his position from the mountain which was 6 miles away. With the lava, ash and gas travelling at up to 600 miles per hour, he had no hope of escaping its destructive path. Not long after the eruption, Johnston's backpack and coat were found buried underneath rubble. However, the discovery was kept from the public, as scavengers had already begun scouring the site, looking for grisly souvenirs from the volcano's victims, which they could sell on for profit. And in 1993, construction workers uncovered pieces of his trailer, yet his body was never recovered. It's widely believed that the work of Johnston and other scientists leading up to the eruption may have saved countless lives by ensuring that as few people as possible were near the volcano when it erupted. They made sure that the area around the volcano remained closed, despite heavy pressure to reopen the area. Had they buckled to pressure, the death toll may have been much higher. Number 2. Vladimir Lenin 
reported to be the last photo ever taken of Lenin. This image depicts the once mighty revolutionary who held the power of life and death over millions, reduced to a wheelchair-bound, frail old man, and strikingly hits home how mortality catches up with us all. His piercing stare is focused on the camera, and when looking at the photo you can't help but feel the dying man is gazing directly into your soul. What could be going through his mind? Is he haunted by the memories of the enormous number of people who suffered as a result of his red terror and mass executions, or has he simply been reduced to a blank slate? Flanked by his sister and one of his doctors, Lenin became wheelchair-bound after suffering three strokes over the previous two years, which left him paralysed and unable to speak. The mental stress of planning and carrying out a revolution, governing a giant country of millions, and fighting a vicious civil war had obviously taken its toll, and he had also survived assassination attempts, which left him with bullets permanently lodged in his collarbone and neck, as well as a punctured lung, injuries which would severely hamper his long-term health. His health nosedived by the end of 1921, with doctors theorising that his sickness might be caused by metal oxidation from the bullets still lodged in his body. In April 1922 the bullets were removed, however his health continued to decline. His illness remained a mystery, and rumours that he might be suffering from syphilis were quickly covered up. He suffered two strokes in 1922, and sensing his impending death, he dictated a document called Lenin's Testament, in which he criticised Stalin and praised Trotsky, even going as far as to recommend that Stalin be removed from his position. In 1923 he suffered a third stroke, and he eventually died on January the 21st, 1924, after falling into a coma. Although the official cause of death was recorded as being an incurable disease of the blood vessels, there has long been talk of a more sinister explanation for his demise. During Lenin's poor health, Stalin had already begun consolidating his own power by appointing loyal supporters to prominent positions, as well as creating an image of himself as Lenin's closest friend and therefore most deserving successor. He even took control over who had access to Lenin, effectively making him a prisoner. Stalin was fully aware that Lenin had wanted him removed from his job, and even claimed that Lenin had asked him to put him out of his misery by giving him a dose of cyanide. Although Stalin publicly refused the supposed request, he certainly had the motive and means for ensuring Lenin died before he could further damage his ambitions. The man was absolutely ruthless, a fact demonstrated by the killing of millions during his purges, and the later execution by ice pick of his rival Trotsky while he was in exile in Mexico. Many suspect that Stalin had arranged for Lenin to be poisoned. Doctors have pointed out that Lenin's repeated seizures in the final days of his life are unusual in a stroke patient, yet common in victims of poisoning, and Lenin had few of the risk factors normally associated with stroke sufferers. Lenin had also been complaining of feeling worse and worse for the last three years of his life, before suffering severe convulsions in his final hours, both of which are symptoms which are uncommon in stroke patients, and following his death, toxicology tests that could have revealed evidence of poisoning were not conducted during his autopsy. Had Lenin survived, he might have lived for many years longer, resulting in Stalin never obtaining power and drastically changing the course of history but such theories about the cause of his death remain speculation. Regardless, his last photo serves as a stark reminder for just how fleeting power and life itself is to all of us. Number 1. Robert Bud Dwyer Robert Bud Dwyer spent much of his adult life as a high school teacher and football coach, however his keen interest in politics led him to seek election as a Republican member of the Pennsylvania State Senate before eventually obtaining the post of Treasurer of Pennsylvania on January the 20th, 1981. It was while holding the office of Treasurer that Dwyer became embroiled in serious corruption charges that could not only result in a lengthy prison sentence, but also destroy his reputation and leave his family destitute. In the early 1980s, it was discovered that Pennsylvania state employees had been overpaying their federal taxes due to a clerical error, to rectify the issue, the complex task of analysing the figures and determining how much compensation should be paid to each employee would need to be carried out. Accounting firms were invited to submit bids for the complex yet lucrative contract, which would be worth $4.6 million to whichever firm was successful. After the contract had been awarded, the state governor received an anonymous tip-off, which alleged that Dwyer, along with several others, 
had received bribes in exchange for using their positions to award the contract to the accounting firm which was eventually chosen to carry out the job. An investigation was immediately carried out by prosecutors, and Dwyer was eventually charged with receiving bribes worth a total of $300,000, an accusation which he vehemently denied. Several other high-ranking officials were also charged, however they agreed to plead guilty to the charges and testify against Dwyer in exchange for more lenient sentences. Dwyer had been offered a similar deal in exchange for pleading guilty, which would have resulted in limited charges and a maximum of five years imprisonment. However, he adamantly refused, which resulted in his case being brought to a full trial, which could see him receiving a sentence of as much as 55 years in prison, along with a $300,000 fine. Dwyer's day in court was a disaster, and on December the 18th, 1986, he was found guilty of several charges, including conspiracy, perjury, and racketeering. Yet in a strange twist to the story, Pennsylvania law meant that despite being convicted, Dwyer could not be removed from his position as treasurer until he was formally sentenced over one month later, on January the 23rd, 1987. Even after his conviction, he maintained that he was innocent and had been framed, going as far as to request a pardon from President Reagan. However, his efforts seemed to be in vain, and as the day of sentencing drew closer, it seemed inevitable that he would likely receive a hefty prison sentence that would see him remain behind bars until his death. The desperate Dwyer arranged for a press conference to be held on January the 22nd, the day before he was due to be sentenced, and just hours before he was to be forcibly removed from the office of treasurer. Dozens of reporters were invited, and although the subject of the conference was not stated, it was assumed that Dwyer intended to announce his resignation as treasurer, thus sparing himself and the office of treasurer the indignity and spectacle of being forcibly removed from the position. However, Dwyer had other plans. Once the press conference started, he began reading from a 21-page statement, lasting 30 minutes. As he reached the end of his speech, he handed three sealed envelopes to his staff, one for the state governor, one for his press secretary, which contained an organ donor card, and one for his family, which was later revealed to contain letters for his wife and two children, as well as suggestions for funeral arrangements. He then produced a magnum revolver, warning the audience, please, please leave the room if this will, if this will affect you. The atmosphere in the room changed from one of near boredom to total chaos. Many of those remaining pleaded with him to put the gun down, while others tried approaching him in an effort to disarm him. Dwyer's last photo shows him warning everybody to stay back, to avoid getting hurt, before he placed the gun in his mouth and pulled the trigger. Five news cameras had recorded the shocking turn of events, however despite not being broadcast live, edited and even unedited versions of the tape would be broadcast by many stations later on that same day. Despite seemingly the last act of a desperate and discredited man, by dying while still technically in office, Dwyer had ensured that his widow was able to collect full survivor benefits, which totaled a massive $1.28 million, thus ensuring that his family would be provided for, rather than being left ruined by the financial costs of his legal defense. Such an ending to his life, along with his denial of any wrongdoing right to the bitter end, led many to question whether he was in fact innocent, and several years later, William T. Smith, the man whose testimony was largely used to convict Dwyer, admitted that he had lied under oath about Dwyer having taken a bribe in exchange for himself receiving a shorter prison sentence. Had Dwyer been wrongfully implicated as he had for so long claimed, or did he end his life due to a combination of shame and desire to see his family cared for financially? His true motives and the question of his innocence remain the subject of speculation and debate. So those are my choices for five haunting lost photos, but what do you think? Let me know which one you found the most striking, as well as what other photos you would have included in the list in the comments below, and I'll see you again on the next video.